Okay, anyway, so just a quick little banger uh, video here, since I already did a video on this uh, very rare plant, which uh, is, you know, losing habitat mostly to, uh, you know, stream bank and uh, river alteration uh, due to farming, uh, like as you can see here. But uh, this plant, uh, Hibiscus lasiocarpus uh, variety occidentalis, uh, is one of only two native hibiscus species that occurs in California. The other is Denodatus, Hibiscus Denodatus, which, believe it or not, is a desert hibiscus, which is kind of odd because you normally think of the genus itself as being very riparian, but uh, Hibiscus Denodatus has very small pink flowers and is very tomatose and white-leaved, and uh, you get that down there by Anza Borrego, et cetera, and what this shit. This uh, Hibiscus Lasiocarpus, the species... Mostly, you know, it grows to Texas. You get even even get a little bit of Illinois. It's in the central uh, United States and into Mexico. This population is called variety Occidentalis because it grows in the West. The nearest population uh, to this variety being in Northwest mainland Mexico as well as in uh, New Mexico. And it's uh, you know, be, there's nothing in between there. There's no Hibiscus laziocarpus in between there. So uh, obviously, there's been a little bit of vicariance uh, in between the two uh, uh, populations, uh, the two varieties. You know, so anyway, we're, uh, we're you know, basically in a floodplain at the Sacramento River. You can see they've turned it. They grow a lot of sunflowers over there. They're growing, uh, I believe this is either soybean or cotton. I don't know. I didn't get a chance to go look. I don't really give a shit, to be honest with you. But uh, you got a native willow. Another common plant around here is a Cephalanthus occidentalis, Rubiaceae. And then, unfortunately, this Himalayan blackberry, which is an extremely aggressive plant. It does have delicious fruits, uh, but I'd much rather have it not be here because it's a pain in the ass to walk through and it outcompetes a lot of native plants, especially native plants like this hibiscus. You can see this plant's gotten established. Uh, it's got wet feet, uh, which it needs. It needs to be in a riparian area, at least have roots that uh, are in a, you know, at the edge of a stream or a edge of a riverbank, etc. But, uh, you know, this has gotten big, but a lot of the seedlings just can't compete. The, uh, this Himalayan blackberry is uh, far too aggressive and just kind of takes over. And it's just, I mean, you can see the fucking thorns on this thing. It's a nightmare to walk through. And there's actually eradication efforts going on trying to get rid of the Himalayan blackberries. They got to cut it and what the shit, then they got to, you know, spot treat it with Roundup, which the hippies don't like. But you really, you don't have any other options because it's just so fucking aggressive. You're going to go and you're going to, you're going to go hand pull every, everything. Uh, you know, I want, I, I'm really curious what keeps the Himalayan blackberry in check in its uh, native habitat. But as you can see, let's take a look at that. It's a delicious fruit though. <laughs> Fucking mosquitoes are just getting pretty bad. Anyway, uh, here's the, uh, the periant on it, that Corolla, as you can see right there. Now you got the stamens all fused around a central column with the style in the middle. Of course, the, the style with that, the, the five-parted stigma, if you could see that. And then the most remarkable thing about the, all the species of hibiscus is this goddamn epicalyx. You see those spikes, those spiky bracts? Now, every plant, of course, has a calyx, which is just the sepals, which right there is those, those wider bracts, if you could see. But then you got the epicalyx, uh, which is a trademark, like I said, of the hibiscus and a, a few other uh, Malvaceae as well. This is the mallow family, same family as cotton. And you got those spiky ass breaks. Just look at the form on that. You got, I mean, that's some Ernst Haeckel shit right there. They're beautiful. Look at those goddamn flowers. You know, there's some really wonderful hibiscus when you get, get into a, you know, central, uh, the central U.S. too, you know. Moshuetos is one. Uh, there's, uh, there's quite a few and they're all, they're all pretty riparian, but they do get these giant periants, these giant corollas the size of grapefruits. Wonderful goddamn genus. Need more of them. Easy to grow in a garden. You just got to keep the soil pretty uh, yeah, wet. At least wet down below. Don't let it dry out fully. But uh, yeah, I wish I wish more people grew, uh, grew more of these. So anyway, real quick, here's another wonderful plant, another riparian plant you see. Now this is very common throughout the southwest and the west, anywhere you got. I think you even got it in the Midwest. This is Cephalanthus occidentalis, coffee family, Rubiaceae. And you can see it's basically a cluster of a bunch of tiny flowers. What the shit are you doing in there? Get out of there! Get out! Get out of there! Now! It's basically a, a cluster of a bunch of different flowers, okay? In which, you know, if the trademarks that he, uh, the Rubiaceae, if you remember, that's the coffee family. It's thir got 13,000 species in it. It's a big-ass family. Psychotria is in there. Psychotria is probably the biggest 
uh, genus. I think it's got, holy shit, I forget. I think it's got quite a few thousand species in it, Psychotria does. Most people just know it because of the stupid druggy bullshit around Psychotria viridis, uh, which is a component of uh, ayahuasca, which is, you know, like a, all the techie guys are trying to do that now to get in touch with their inner selves and feel their feelings and shit since they uh, had relatively uh, emotionally repressive and depauperate. Hey, I can't fault them for it. Most of us do. Emotionally repressive and uh, emotionally depauperate uh, childhoods where we're taught to repress what we feel and not talk about it or think about it or instead maybe just drink it away. But uh, so now they want to feel their feelings. They're, they're doing ayahuasca and psychedelics or whatever. I overall support it. I just, you know, it's just kind of a fad. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, uh, interesting to watch from a background. Anyway, I, I digress. Here's a Cephalanthus occidentalis. You can see it's a flower cluster. Rubiaceae is known for what's called the salverform corolla, which is basically just a fancy word for a long tubular corolla. And if you get up there and you look at some of these older flowers where the flowers, the individual florets have already started to spread out, you can see that silver form corolla right there, you know, with those long exerted prominent uh, stamens. Stamens and styles? Where the fuck are the styles? I can't, anyway, whatever. Uh, but uh, you can see the individual florets where you can see their silver form shape. Now they got a silver form corolla with fused, uh, Fused petals, just meaning they're together, not individual petals um, like you would see on some flowers. They're, uh, they're united. They're what's called fused or united, which is an important trademark to look at when you're looking at the flowering plants. Are the petals on the perianth fused or united? God, the mosquitoes are finally starting to fucking drive me nuts. Another thing they got is that probably because I'm talking a lot. Maybe I, uh, the mosquitoes here, did they hear me uh, coming? Not are really attacking me. They, they got the interpetiolar stipules which is another tr important trademark of the Rubiaceae, the coffee family. Look at that, interpetiolar stipules just means if you get up there and you look at, the, first off, they got opposite leaves, another uh, important, not 100%, but generally common trademark on Rubiaceae. And then you got the basically the stipules, uh, you know, stipules just being a little uh, bracked, basically that either subtends or is above the leaf. And... Uh, you can see the interpetiolar stipules right there. There you go. Cephalanthus occidentalis. Great plant. Uh, Rubiaceae. Wonderful family. Uh, important to know about, especially if you're in the subtropics or uh, tropics. It's got a pan-tropical distribution, Rubiaceae, meaning it's uh, basically all over the equator. All around the globe. Okay, so you know what? Uh, you know what this plant is? It is actually provides me a great opportunity to show your ass what's going on with Malvaceae. It's another plant in the Malvaceae, in the Mallow family. Gossypium, uh, which is cotton, basically. Now, if you look here at a cotton flower, you can see the same thing going on that you see going on with the uh, hibiscus flowers. In other words, you got a bunch of stamens fused around a central column, and at the top of that central column is the female part, the stigma. So they're fused around the style, and then that turns into that five part, that five lobe thing, the stigma, which receives the pollen. And it's uh, generally called an androgynophore, Passiflorace, a lot of Passiflora. Uh, passion flower species. I don't know how many hundreds of species of Passiflora there are. A lot of passion flowers do that same thing. They got an androgynophore. They got uh, basically the, the the stamens and the stigma are united into a central column uh, that connects uh, above the perianth. Very interesting thing going on there. Androgynophore. You don't need to you don't need to use that fancy terminology. Just knows the male parts. You got a lot of stamens and they're surrounding a central column. And in the middle of that central column is the style and the stigma. Remember, it's the pistillate flowers. Pistol's counterintuitive. You normally think dong, but it's actually, pistil is the female uh, part of the flower. It's, it's in, in all its parts. Pistils are composed of stigma from the top down. Stigma, style, over. All right, I just gotta make this quick because I'm getting fucking devoured. The mosquitoes, they weren't out at first, but now they're finally out. They must have sensed my CO2 and uh, you know they're coming out to just make my life hell. Here's the, uh, the dehiscent fruits from last year on that hibiscus. And then another trademark of Malvaceae too, of course, is these, what you call palmate leaves. And a lot of Malvaceae, some of them almost look like, uh, you know, maple leaves. They got lobes. Fermanodendron uh, californicum's got three lobes. Fermanodendron mexicanum's got five lobes. A nice little cute spider over there. You kill some mosquitoes. But let's go back to those sexy parts, huh? So you got, you can see the epicalyx right there. Perfect, look at eight. Look at those breaks. Okay, you got the epicalyx, then you got the general calyx, which are those wider bracts, and then you got the corolla. And then going further in there, you got the androgynophore. Look at all those goddamn stamens, huh? 
And then, of course, the style, which is pretty notable on a Malvasie, at least on hibiscus, is in those five parts. See those little five mushroom-looking things? They almost look like five little mushrooms. That's what receives the pollen. And uh, I think, I believe all hibiscus have uh, had that. I mean, shit, the gossypium, the cossum, that's the, the cotton that's behind me just had that shit too. So, uh, anyway... This is a wonderful goddamn plant. I wish more people grew this. It'd be good for a garden, you know, because you could keep them irrigated. They don't need the soil to be wet, but they need it to be, be wet at least, you know, a foot or two down there beneath the soil surface. They need, that's why they grow on stream banks or riparian areas and what the shit. They do a lot better in the humid climates, but you can see this thick uh, layer of fuzz. Too. Look at the abaxial surface on that leaf. Look at all those hairs. God damn. Helps in keeping it. Remember, the stomata, the, the gas pores, the pores that let in the CO2 on most plants are on the abaxial surface that's the lower, the underside of the leaf. That's why you commonly get fuzz on the undersides more than you do on the tops of the leaves. But there's even a little, little bit of fuzz on the top of the leaf. But the, the, the majority of the, uh, the velvet, the velvety shit is down here. There's like six different botanical words for hair. Strigos, tomentos, pubescent, puberulin, etc. What the shit... Uh, all you got to really need to know is that it's woolly and it's, and it's an adaptation to the dry climate that, uh, that I'm in right now. And basically, it is very dry. I mean, you know, you go to the East Coast, the Midwest, you got those humid, humid summers where you get winter rain and shit. It's so much more verdant and green than here. The only reason that shit's green is because it's getting irrigated. The only reason this shit's green is because there's a, a water source about six feet beyond there. You know, overall, it's very dry. That's why we get wildfires up the yin-yang and shit, you know, once... Uh, once the dry season starts, you basically got to think of this whole this whole region is a sponge that gets soaked in the winter and then slowly dries out over the over the months. You know, come June, July, August, September, by October, it's a fucking tinderbox waiting to go up. With climate change, shit, it's a tinderbox right now. Come in, you know, July or or August, it's not too hot yet. But uh, anyway, oh, you got one of the uh, non-native invasive honeybees pollinating this uh, hibiscus. So again, one of the only two uh, species of hibiscus to occur in California naturally. I believe there's a, a naturalized European one. They fucking parent this golden. All right, real, real nice, real sexy parts. Okay, you got the androgynophore, you know, two or three dozen stamens fused around a central column with the five-parted stigma up top. How about that, huh? And those palmate leaves, almost palmate leaves, arrow-shaped in this case, but in a lot of Malvaceae, they're palmate, and of course, big uh, pain in the ass com competition for us is Himalayan blackberry, which needs to die. Okay, one last little thing I'm going to use with this fruit to show you basically two botanical terms that can be a pain in the ass. You got, in terms of uh, a capsule, which is what this is, you got loculicidal capsules and septicidal capsules. Now, now basically, septicidal capsules means this is a loculicidal capsule. Capsule. Okay, you got the septa, which are these these ribs basically that the uh, were fused together at one point before this thing opened up, as you can see. Now, basically, if this was a septicidal capsule, this thing would come apart on those septa. But since it's loculicidal capsules, it comes apart inside, uh, you know, in between the septa, uh, the septa right there. So uh, it's a, it's a loculicidal capsule, and of course, it's got five carpels, which are just basically the seed chambers. And you can tell uh, that probably has something to do with the fact that that stigma has uh, it, it's basically five parted. So a uh, real interesting flower morphology going on with these. Again, the seeds look like little kind of floaty balls, you know. And I think uh, they, I think they mostly float in water, and it's probably to help with the way that they're dispersed, being that it's a fucking riparian plant and it grows in streams. They're, you know, the stream is probably what disperses them mostly. I can't. I mean, I guess maybe birds do to an extent too. But and you can see how all that gets impeded uh, with the the mass amount of uh, non-native invasives growing, especially that blackberry. Just the. Uh, out competes them, they got no room to grow.